The whiteboard's a bit flimsy, so you'll have to bear with that. How's everyone today? I'm getting more and more excited. Yeah? Oh, is there a... I thought that was my mobile phone, and if I have, I'll just make sure I turn it off. We do have a mobile phone, but I have it with me re so rarely that I rarely turn it on. <laughs> so nobody can get me anyway. <laughs> So how have you been the last few months? Yeah. How many of you, uh, this is the first time you've come to a talk like this? How many of you? So a few. You know, welcome along. It's nice to meet you. And I hope you enjoy yourself and ask as many questions as you wish today and don't be feel embarrassed. Um, I haven't chosen the subject that I was going to talk to you about today yet. So what would you like to talk about? <laughs> Processing, emotions. Processing emotions, yeah. Um, any other alternatives? You want to? If we use the mics from now on, that'd be good. So that way uh, we can get a recording of what's being said. Um, something about is that working? Uh, it's on off, yeah. And if you just hold it fairly close to you, that's working, yeah. Um, that's something it. about earth changes, and particularly with Coffs Harbour. <laughs> <laughs> We're all freaking out about I'm wondering how much fear is in that question. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a pause. May, may I just make a comment about it? Many of you have a lot of fear about that question, and that's causing you to not follow your desires rather than rather than. So, you, in other words, you're you're making choices or decisions based upon fear. And choices and decisions based upon fear only result in worse things happening in your life. Does that make sense? So every time you make a choice or a decision based upon fear, what you're really doing is actually you're going to finish up attracting even more difficult events into your life than the ones you're trying to prevent. Right? So it's far better to deal with your fears. So I think I might leave that subject alone today and suggest instead that all of you who are worried, who are worried here in Coffs Harbour need to deal with some fears. Now, to help you deal with some fears... No, no, I won't say anything about... <laughs> I won't say anything about what's going to happen to Coffs Harbour. And the truth is that, that when you deal with your fears, you will have a lot of clarity about what you want to do. And when you follow your desires, that's when, in fact, things work very, very smoothly. And so if that means um, you wanting to move away from the location or anything like that, you will follow your desires and passions rather than following your fears. And the issue that, to bear in mind is that you may finish up out of fear moving from a location into another location where you attract a whole series of events because of your fear. Does that make sense? That is guaranteed while the fear is within you. So, so it's much more important for you to address the issue of your fear and terror than it is to actually answer questions about what's going to happen to Coffs Harbour come Earth Changes. Now, obviously, any place on the coast is going to have some difficulties, which you can understand. Um, obviously, if there are large Earth Change events, and, uh, and things like, you know, continents shifting and uh, up and down, not, not just <laughs> sideways, but up and down, and obviously earthquakes, volcanoes and other kinds of events associated with that, then there's obviously going to be a lot of water-based events as well as a result of that. And any place around the sea is obviously going to have some kind of effect. Now, while I can describe to you what probably is going to happen at this point to Coffs Harbour, it's much wiser for you to deal with your fear than it is for me to have a discussion with you about what's going to happen to one specific location. Does that make sense? Because in the end, we could go around from town to town having chats with everyone, and the only question I'm answering is, what's going to happen to our town? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And uh, it is far better. I'm far more interested in what's going to happen to your soul than the town. <laughs> what's going to happen inside of you? How are you going to go with your relationship with God? Whether you pass or not, come future events, how are you going to act in terms of your soul? What's going to be your soul's choices and decisions? So that's where I'd like to focus my attention. So the emotional discussion certainly is a part of that. But is there another subject that somebody would like to... 
Yes, I'd, I'd like to have a little bit of clarity around what we consider uh, love and what, what and God's love and, and the comparisons in that. In terms of, uh, so what our beliefs about love are? Our beliefs about love to in, um, uh, compared to what, a, what, 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 what is really what love is really love from God's from perspective. God's perspective. Yep. Yes, that's a very good. Oh, actually, myself and Mary are going to give a series of talks on that subject. We're going to call them lessons in love. Uh, we've already began. I've already given one or two talks on the subject of lessons in love, and we will be doing a series of them. But I'm certainly happy to. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is select the subject from your suggestions. So that's a good. So that was about lessons in love, basically. Um, can we, Diana, and then across? Yeah. Um, I'd like to um, hear more about the really um, deep generational issues between men and women, right. male, female. Yeah. So in terms of emotional processing, what are the blockages between yeah. the genders? Yeah, on that. And yeah. what's going on between the genders? Yeah. yeah, good subject. Yeah, mine is similar. It's about accessing emotional blocks that relate to ancestral stuff that's come. Through. Okay, so um, and and obviously that question also involves spirits because uh, a lot of ancestral stuff is heavily motivated by the ancestral spirits who have passed. So you know, there's a lot whole he he heap of things that that opens, uh, like a Pandora's box of things that, uh, that opens, but yeah, certainly. Well, it sounds to me like the majority of you like to hear about your emotional work and processing emotions and uh, different things involved with your emotions. But I think probably what I'd like to do is give you a bit of a background about the soul as well and how the soul works. And uh, that will help you understand what's going on inside of you emotionally a bit more. And then we can start looking at the influences upon the soul and, and how you can start accessing your emotions in a pure way rather than still acting upon your addictions. Because one of the biggest problems on the planet is addictive emotions. You know, we, we're so strongly in our addictions that we finish up uh, not dealing with a lot of our emotions even when we think we are. So many of us finish up crying sometimes for months on a, different su on a subject but, but at the end of the day, crying is not the object of this goal of dealing with your emotions. The object of the goal is to release the causal emotion. That's the object, because it's the causal emotion that prevents your relationship with God. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? So, so it's like, he, so here's God. There's God. Here's your soul, your half of the soul. And for a connection to be maintained, your half of the soul needs to be open emotionally. So, so whatever is inside of me prevents this connection with God. So I can desire God's love to enter me, but while I have an, a, an emotion that's preventing that love from entering me, then obviously that love can't enter me, no matter how much I think I'm desiring it. And the problem is for most of us that we think we're desirous of it, when in reality, at, reality, at the same time, we've got a lot of blocks towards God. We've got a lot of problems with God. And in fact, even the term God, many of us have a lot of problems with uh, before we even begin trying to develop a relationship with God. So the whole point of dealing with emotions in the soul is about unblocking yourself firstly to God, but then to everyone around you. Because it's your emotional blockages that dictate much of your relationships with everyone around you. So if I've got an emotional blockage inside of me, for example, towards women who are a bit overbearing and dominating, then that emotional blockage will prevent me from, from really having any good interactions with a woman who's overbearing and dominating. Can you see that? And, and I might finish up responding in anger or rage towards them, and in the end I'll uh, probably expel them from my life and stay away from every woman in that place. And obviously, if we get into a state of love, we want to get to a state where we can love everybody in all the interactions. Which brings up the question, well, what is love then? Well, the truth is that all of us know what love is, actually. In fact, right from the moment we were a little child, we know what love is. But it's the absence of love that gets mixed with love that confuses us. Now, what I mean by that is, when we're growing up, when we're very young, Often we're told, I'm loving you while 
the parent is giving us a belting. Now, does that feel like love to the child at that moment? No, like it feels like violent, scary, painful, right? It feels all pain, violence and, and fear is all being... And, and, I'm, and the parent is saying to the child, I'm doing this because I love you. Now, straight away, can you see what happens under those circumstances is our, our viewpoint of love becomes distorted. So now the child's feeling... This doesn't feel like love to me. This doesn't feel like love to me. This feels scary, painful and terrible to me. That's what the child's feeling in that moment. But in the same moment, the, the, the parent is saying, I'm doing this because I love you. And so we're starting to learn a correlation between violence, fear and punishment and love. Does that make sense? So we come, become very confused. The truth is, though, all of us know that violence doesn't feel good. Right? All of you know that when somebody comes up and bops you in the nose, it's not a very pleasant feeling. Even if you've not personally experienced and you've noticed somebody else, ha had happened to somebody else, you know, yeah, they didn't look too pleased about that. Right? And the truth is that even when we were children and we were getting physically punished, most of us weren't too pleased about it. We were often terrified or angry about that occurring. So the truth is we do know what love is, most of us, but we ref what happens is we grow up, our, we start co-relating love with unloving acts. So there becomes a correlation between love and violence, love and fear, love and pain, love and punishment. And so we start accepting a lot of false beliefs about love as we grow. Now it's these false beliefs about love that enter the soul emotionally. Right? So there's emotions that are all these false beliefs about love that enter our soul. And so what's happening is inside of us, and remember our soul isn't our physical form, so here's our physical form, and, and it, nor is it our spirit body, our spirit form, but rather it's the thing that encompasses both that spirits cannot even see, and it's actually your true self. It's the person you really are. And what happens is all of these emotional belief systems which are all about love or a lack of it in the end, all enter you and they all become a part of you. So inside of you, right at the moment, there's some false beliefs about love and there's some true beliefs about love and there's some very, very grey areas in between. You know, like, is it loving to lie? Well, most of the time, no, but it, white lies are okay. So that's a loving thing. You see, we, we have all these grey areas happening within us as well. And the reason why is because all these things enter us emotionally and now they're in our soul and they dictate our life. They completely control our life. Right? Now, that's why releasing the emotions or connecting to the emotions is an important part of connecting to yourself and connecting to other people. But even more importantly, if we're looking at our relationship with God, an important part of having a relationship with God. Our emotions become a key integral part of that. So if I have an emotion in me that I expect to be able to be punished if somebody loves me, that is going to determine what kind of conduct I put up with from my environment, isn't it? So, so I might believe punishment is love, so I'll start even projecting at God. Actually, God, um, God is a punishing God. And can you see how that belief has now entered most religious, religious forms? That God is a punishing God. Because, because when I grew up, when I was a child, my mother and father said to me while they were punishing me that I'm loving you and this is essential for you. Right? And there are, of course, other forms of discipline uh, other than punishment, but uh, we have this viewpoint that, uh, that punishment is one of the most effective means because it's painful. And then we start assuming then that God must also have the same system. Right? So we start projecting our beliefs about love onto God. We start assuming God's like our parents, in other words. That's what we start assuming. And as a result of that, these emotions about God have now entered our soul. And our emotions about our parents have now entered our soul. And even emotions about ourselves have entered the soul now and a part of us, where we feel that actually... 
we're, we're a bad girl or a bad boy, even though you might not have been much a bad boy or a bad girl most of your childhood, if your parent has told you you are all the time, then you will start to think that that must be true. Why would they be telling you a lie? And, you, you know, and so you start assuming these things are true. And so distortion about love of self. We have a distortion about what constitutes a love of another and we have a distortion about what constitutes love of God. Can you see how like, it's all entered us emotionally? It's all just present inside of us emotionally. And then on top of that, we have a whole heap of people who have been in the past generations of people here living here on earth who are now in the spirit world. So let's represent those as males and females who have passed into the spirit world, who are now spirits, who also have a set of beliefs about love, which came from their childhood on earth and their life while they were on earth. So now they've grown up, they finished up growing up, becoming old and then passing, but many of them still have in their heads exactly the same beliefs about love that they had while they're on earth. One of the things I've been saying over and over to everyone is, you know, passing doesn't change you. There's only one thing it changes, and that is you no longer have a physical body. It doesn't change the rest of you. It's not, there's not some magic cure to all of the ills of it that are inside of you, and nor is it some magic cure of all of a sudden you discovering all truths. So we often have the assumption that when we pass, we'll all of a sudden become you know, the guru. But in reality, we're going to be exactly the same person we are right now, with one exception, and that is we know we've passed. And even that might not be certain, because many spirits don't know they've passed, for lots of different reasons. So here they are in the spirit world, these spirits who have a whole set of beliefs and emotions about love as well. Now, of course, they then want to project those beliefs onto the living. So they put a lot of effort in pushing onto the living these beliefs that they have retained through their life about love. And if I have a set of beliefs that allow them to connect to me, I will then be very influenced by these belief systems that even the spirits have around me about love. So, so here we are with this individual, now an adult perhaps, and we've grown up and we've got my parents' beliefs about love that have entered me, my parents' treatment of, of me, which has entered me as my beliefs about my love of self, and I've also got the spirits historically, you know, generations and generations of spirits who have got all sorts of beliefs in my race or my culture about love. And all of those have now entered me as well. And then on top of that, there's all these beliefs from my environment about what constitutes love between a God and me. Now, that's a lot of crap isn't it, basically, <laughs> that, that is overlaying our soul in terms of our relationships with all, everyone around us. So, so let's say what I do then with that. What do I do? You have to bear with this. Uh, what do I do with these? So what, what happens is there's our soul, right? and here's the soul of another person. Let's say this other person happens to be the soul of our partner the person that's living with us, right? So now what has happening, I don't know why I drew it a bit smaller, but anyway. Um, what's happening now is there's an interaction between these two people, isn't there? And almost all interactions are going to be emotional between these two people. And even the words that come out of your mouth are going to be very much driven by the emotions that are inside of you, the feelings that you have inside of you, whatever those feelings are. So let's say I meet Mary and I believe in a God because that's been my childhood and my upbringing and everything. And Mary doesn't believe in a God. She believes in some kind of universal energy. Now, now we're straight away on a different end of the spectrum when it comes to discussing anything about God, aren't we? Now, if on top of that, I have another belief that's entered me, which is listening to women is a bad idea... And, and, you know, men are better than women on most things. If I have that emotional belief that's entered me from my parents and my, you know, mum and dad may have had that same belief. So when Mary then starts to tell me about her belief, like what's happening straight away inside of me emotionally? Inside of me emotionally is just basically a wall, isn't there? 
a wall that prevents communication between the two of us. The irony is, though, that that wall doesn't even need to exist and actually wouldn't exist if I knew how to love completely and there would be no wall even though we had different opinions about a subject. So at the moment what's happening is my emotions, so my arrogance with women, right, is like a wall, a block between our souls connecting on some level. Does that make sense? Now you marry that person and after a while that wall is going to be exposed, isn't it? At some point in your interactions, one or both of you are going to get tired of that wall existing. Right? And, and that's what creates a lot of the problems that we have in our day-to-day -day life within our interactions with others. Is We have all of these different walls up, all these different beliefs up, and you could think of them as just blockages to different types of other beliefs that are, that are being reflected from my environment. And so what finishes up happening is I start to speak about a subject and instead of having everyone on the same page, every single individual who's hearing those words is on a totally different page. Does that make sense? And how can it not be like that? Because we've all got a different upbringing, different personality and different way of accept and different emotions in the, at the end that we've accepted as true. Now, if you think about it, if we all knew what God knew about love, so in other words, we all began to accept the truth, the divine truth about love, that would automatically have a binding effect, wouldn't it, on things? It would bring everything together because it would help all of us start to understand each other and we'd start to understand, oh, that's not harmonious with love, but that is, and we'd, we'd understand it from God's perspective. And you see, most of the time what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid anyone else's perspective other than our own. Right? So, so AJ gets up and starts talking about God. My perspective of God is that God's a universal energy or force. And then AJ's saying, no, 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 that's not correct. That's the creation of God. Let's look at God. God is actually an entity. How can God be an entity? That doesn't make any sense to me. You know? And who wants God being an entity? Good, goodness me, that makes God like my mum or dad. And who wants something like that? You know, someone who's going to punish me and get upset with me and you know all it, so all of my emotions start getting imposed upon the discussion and so can you see that this truth about love which God actually has inside of herself can only enter me when I release the errors about love that I have stored with inside of me how else am I going to accept the truth about love without releasing the errors about love that I actually have and to do that, I must firstly admit that I even have an error about love. Can you see that? Because you see, the majority of us think that what we know must be true. And uh, um, I don't know if your parents have ever played a trick on you that, you that has stayed with you for a lifetime, but I've met some people who have asked their parents a certain question. The parents gave them an answer as there's one lady I knew, she, she asked, she, she was looking with Dad over the bonnet right, of the car and looking at the battery and, and, and asked, what's that? And Dad himself didn't really know what it was. So what he did was he came up with an explanation of his own that wasn't true. And this lady believed that for the rest of her life until we had a discussion over a bonnet about what the battery was. <laughs> right? and, and can you see, like, we can obviously many times accept a belief as true if somebody else portrays it as truth to us. So at the moment, you have got right at this moment a group of spirits in your ear portraying to you truth. Right? Some of it is going to be in agreement with what I'm speaking of and some of it is going to be in disagreement with what I'm speaking of because they will have their own opinions as to what truth is. And, and while at, at the moment, you, after you listen to this discussion today, you'll go home and go, yeah, I don't agree with what he said there and I don't agree with what he said here. All right? And when you will discuss it with some friends and your friends will go, yeah, no, I don't agree with that either. He's a bit of an idiot actually thinking that. Um, and all of a sudden what we're doing is we're still looking at things from our own perspective. We like doing this, don't we? We like to know things from our own perspective. But it's not a very good way of learning truth. Because learning truth means getting rid of our own perspective and actually starting to 
focus on what is God's perspective. That's the only way in the end to learn truth. We had an interesting discussion during the week. Um, we, we were staying uh, here in um, Rachel's lovely home in the hinterland and, uh, and we had a group of mediums come and visit us and so we spent a few days and there were some spirits who came to talk with us. Um, you've heard of the Palladian spirits. Uh, many of you would have probably heard of them. And they came to talk with us because they wanted to portray their version of the truth um, and they felt... They wanted to have a discussion. And then after a while we had a discussion and they went off to investigate these other things that I presented to them about the truth. And then they came back later and uh, one of the things they mentioned was that they believed they knew but now they realised that they didn't know. Does that make sense? And this is the beauty of uh, being open and humble is if we're open and humble we'll allow ourselves to not know. We'll allow ourselves to conceive that perhaps we don't know everything, right? And in fact, if we're really humble, we'll allow ourselves to believe that from the perspective of the creator of the universe, we know pretty much nothing at all, right? Don't we? In comparison. Well, you think God created the body. Do you know how the body works? Does any person on this planet even know how the body works, really, at this point? They don't. They replace parts and all sorts of things, but they still don't really know how it all works. And even a tree, we don't really know how it works, right? We've got all these theories and we've got all these things about photosynthesis that we learn and all these other things that we've investigated, but still, a lot of things, a lot of living things on this planet are just a total enigma to us. Now... The creator of this universe created all those things. Now, if you create something, do you know how it works? Yes, yes you do, don't you? Like, m many of us have been involved when we were younger, perhaps if you were male in particular, be involved in creating a car. You know, you might have got together with dad and built a car or changed the mo motor or a motorcycle engine or whatever. And of course, after you've gone through that entire process, you know how the car works to a large degree then, don't you? Only then, really. Before then, it's just a clump of metal that seems to go when you kick over the engine or whatever. Up until that point, we don't know much at all. And it's only when we investigate and we have all the knowledge. But if we're the creator of it, then we have a large degree of knowledge about it. So obviously, God has this infinite knowledge about the universe. And it would make sense that if I could listen to God tell me how it all works, that would be the simplest way of growing would it not? Right? And, uh, and a lot of people then go, oh, but that's assuming there is a God. Right? Well, let's assume there's not a God for a moment. Let's assume that the universe is God for a moment, as a lot of people want to believe. Now, it doesn't make much sense in, logically or emotionally when you think about that because, like, how, have you ever created something yourself that came from no effort? inside of you at all. Like you just sat there in the living room and all of a sudden TV appeared, lounge, and you just threw your, you, you didn't even think about it, you just thought, oh, I'll have that, and then all of a sudden it's there, and I have that. Like I dream of genie style, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, and it all comes to you. Now, none of us have ever thought that we can create anything without effort. Is that not correct? And, and none of us, and with every one of those things that have been created, They've all been created by someone. So every one of us come here in a vehicle, yes, a car, probably. So when you sit down and you look at the car, you go, yeah, it's amazing how that just got here by itself. You don't, do you? In fact, none of us would even conceive of thinking that. A car with 20, 30, 40,000 parts, depending on what model or make you have, um, just got there by itself without any effort, or any design, any maker. Like, none of us would conceive that. And yet, we believe that a more complicated thing with that our car, our, when our car came in and parked, it parked next to a heap of vegetation that some of us probably barely noticed. And yet, that vegetation is far more complicated than any vehicle, and we think that it got here by itself. Does that make logical sense to you? And if we allow ourselves to allow that process to develop, then it makes sense there is some kind of creative force. 
And if there's some kind of creative force, that creative force must know how the creation works. And if there is, if this, there is this creative force that knows how creation works, doesn't it make sense to me that if I can connect to that creative force, that would be the fastest way for me to learn anything? Does that, does that make logical sense to everyone? So let's assume, let's call this creative force God for the sake of the argument. And the creative force now wants to educate you. What's the first thing that must be done if you want to be educated by this creative force? Well, you have to know how to receive information from it, don't you? Isn't that logical? If I don't know how to receive information from it, it's going to be impossible for me to receive information from God if I don't know how to receive information. Now, the, if you think about it, it's exactly the same with all of our interactions with humans, isn't it? What's our interactions with humans? Our interactions with humans are, as long as they speak the same language of me, there's a good chance <laughs> that we can have a fairly decent communication between each other. Now, they don't even need to speak the same language for me to understand some things, do they? So if I went like, to, uh, to you, uh, you know, no, I'm not wanting to throw up. And, you know, you, you, you will interpret that in a few different ways, won't you? Like, is that, does he want to throw up? No, 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 I don't think he wants to throw up. And then he goes like this. Oh, oh you want to eat, you want to eat, you want something to eat. So we, we have the capability of communicating at some level, even through actions. But there has to be a mechanism. There has to be an understanding of some kind before we can begin communication. And the same goes with this creative force. If this creative force created us, surely it also created us with the ability to communicate with the creative force. Does that make sense? And, and so here we are. This is us. And I'll draw us as a round ball, which I'll call a soul. There has to be some way that I can communicate. And what we've talked about in the past, and there's all these MP3s on the net now about the discussion, about how this communication works. And the communication works by you having a longing for love from this creative force. And everything in the universe is actually surrounding love. And as long as you have a longing for love from this creative force to enter you, along with that love, comes packets of information about all sorts of things around you. Things that you weren't aware of before. So for example, the awareness of the soul begins to build once you have this love entering you and you start realising actually I'm not this spirit body that everybody's talked about that's got chakras and all that kind of stuff. I'm actually more complicated than that. There's this other thing behind all of that. And I'm not this physical body that I have. And an awareness comes through this connection with God. That's how every piece of information can be learned from God. So all that needs to happen, really, is for you and I to learn how to connect to God to learn all truth. That's all that needs to happen. We don't even have to rely on each other to do this at all. You don't have to rely on another person to tell you the truth because in the end you can connect directly with God and the only thing is to learn how to connect directly with God. How does a mother connect directly with her child? It's quite simple, isn't it? The mother has a feeling of love for her child and then over a period of time the child develops within itself a desire for that love which then the mother can receive and feel, can she not? Even if, even if there is no verbal communication, this is possible. And in fact, there's a new method of, uh, of bringing up children uh, where the mother feels the child's emotions and only feeds the child when the emotion is, I want to feed. And they feel the child's emotions about whether they feel uncomfortable and the mother responds to that emotion of discomfort. So you know how in the past what we've done when we bring up children is generally the child's crying and we go, all right, let's look at the main things like food, uh, backside dirty, no, wet, no. And then we, once we get beyond that, we're starting to sort of scratch our heads, aren't we? 
right? And sometimes then we're there holding the child, trying to comfort the child, but we don't really know what's wrong with the child, right? Well, when you can feel the child, you will know exactly what is wrong with the child at any moment, right? And this is the same with the communication we've got. And, and doctors have discovered this process, right? And it's quite a recent discovery, and they're actually now trying to teach women how to connect emotionally to their child and actually discover what's really going on with the child step by step inside themselves. They can feel the child and why the child is having the discomfort it's having. Does that make sense? And uh, so it's well known. It's also well known there's been... Um, you've all heard of Deepak Chopra? Yep, he's got a foundation in the States. And in that foundation, they've done a lot of tests. And the, well, some of the tests are where they've had a mother who's breastfeeding the child. And they put a child down one end of an of a auditorium in a completely secluded booth, right? With, with um, obviously cameras and test equipment there just observing the child. And then they put the mother in a totally secluded radio frequency uh, limited area up the other end of the booth. So, so they are completely separated from each other. They can't hear each other. There's no method of normal communication as we know it on the earth today. No electronic interference can occur, any other thing. They've isolated all those things. And what they did then is they waited for the child to wake up hungry. And when the child woke up hungry and started crying for a feed, the mother's breast began lactating. And that happens, many of you will notice. You need to use the microphone. <laughs> yeah, are you excited? <laughs> Speak into the microphone. Yeah, in regards to that, we brought a car and the baby seat was in the old car. So the husband's with the baby in that car and I've driven the new car home and next thing, you know, like an hour later, I'm letting down like he wouldn't believe yeah, me. You know, yeah. I was saturated. Yeah. And he was like a quarter of a mile or more in front of me. Right, yeah. So that was that's the same sort of same thing. Same thing. Yeah. And, and so there has to be some form of communication, does there not, between the, the baby and its mother, obviously. And it has to be a form of communication. It's not verbal, right? And, and you're not necessarily feeling it as a feeling at this point, so you don't know whether it's a feeling or not, but there has to be some form of communication for the body to respond in such a manner. Does that make sense to everyone? Of course it, it makes sense. So, so if that's the case, there must be a capacity in the real us, the soul, let's call it, there has to be a capacity in the real us to be sensitive to what's going on around us at a level that most of us are not even connecting to. Does that make sense? And I put forward to you that that is your soul. That is your soul's ability to connect. Every one of us right now are not just connecting to the words, but you're connecting at the soul level. You, there's feelings that you're getting, not only from me, but also from each other. And also feelings you're getting from, spirit, from people who have passed into the spirit world and who are present here, and there's quite a number, and you are getting feelings from them as well. All right? So that bearing, bearing that in mind, the real us is capable of all of these different forms of communication that we as humans are barely on the verge of discovering. Does that make sense to everyone? And what I'm putting forward to you is that, is that, is that this is the capacity of the soul and what drives it are the soul's, con what I would call the soul's condition. And the soul's condition, specifically, is an amalgamation of things. It's an amalgamation of your emotional belief system and your desires and passions and longings. So in other words, what you believe right now is a part of this soul, but also what you desire right now is a part of the soul. And I would put forward to you that actually every time what you believe or desire is in harmony with the love that God says is loving, then you will actually automatically be able to create things that will result in your happiness. And whatever you believe that is inside of your soul, whether they are desires or just emotional beliefs that are based upon fear, 
they will automatically create things that are painful to the soul. All right? So your soul has this automatic feedback system going on. Every time I'm in pain, I know that I'm out of harmony with love. Now, how many of you have believed that love hurts? Yeah, it's like most of us in the past have, haven't we? In the past, that we believe that love hurts, yeah? But in reality, love will never hurt because if love is reflected the way God reflects it, in other words, if love is in harmony with truth, it will never, ever hurt you. So when you hurt from loving or a so-called loving relationship, it's automatically telling you that that must be based on fear rather than love. Does that make sense? And fears drive your addictions. That's what fear does. We, are, we become addicted to things because we don't want to feel our fears and feel the underlying emotions that the fears are covering. So, we have a whole set of emotions underneath the fear. Usually these emotions are emotions like grief, shame, guilt, and other emotions, personal shame and so forth. Sexual shame and all sorts of things are in that area. And then we have a lot of fear that helps us suppress those emotions. And this was created in us w w during our childhood as well. When you think about it, how many of you felt when you were crying that you couldn't handle your tears? Like, how many children feel they can't handle their tears? Personally, I, I don't see many of them, really. Like, most children seem to be able to handle tears pretty well, don't they? They're perfectly prepared to cry for a half an hour if they need to cry for a half an hour, aren't they? Most children. You see a little baby, a little newborn baby, if it's hungry and it's not getting fed, it's happy to cry until it gets fed. It has no blockage about crying until then, does it? It doesn't have any shutdown mechanism going on. So, so the child understands emotion far better. It knows that emotion can flow. But as we grow up, we start piling fears upon the emotion. And that shuts down the emotion. That closes down the entire system. And every time we act in harmony with fear, we're acting out of harmony with love, and therefore we'll, we will be involved in a painful experience as a result. It's only, the, all of our painful experiences are the results of our acting out of harmony with love or they're the result of us releasing an emotion from our past that is out of harmony with love. That's where all of our pain comes from, including our physical pain. All of our physical pain is exactly the same. So whatever illness we have, whatever disease we have, whatever even just ache or pain we have in our body, the whole fact that we age is all a part of this. It's all a part of the emotions that we're holding on to that are relating to fear. And it's the fear that suppresses the release of the underlying emotion. And then on top of the fear, we often have the rage, you know, the anger. So when we're in the angry space, we're at another level of denial of the underlying emotion. And so here we are, we're, we're this person that obviously, from this illustration that we used earlier about the child with its mother, has the ability to communicate in far better ways than what we're currently doing. And yet what we finish up doing is shutting down all those methods of communication by actually not feeling a group of emotions which we then store within ourselves, within our soul, and we then pile a heap of fear on top of it so that we don't have to feel it anymore. And then because the fear often gets triggered by our environment, because that's the way God's created your environment, the law of attraction will bring you anything you fear generally. So what you do then is every time something happens that you're afraid of, you get angry instead. And that's a great way of preventing the whole thing from unravelling. Right? And so instead, so now what we've got is this layer of anger on top of this fear that's all now suppressing these causal emotions inside of us, right? And then because we are so addicted to actually never feeling terror or fear, we're so addicted to it, we're just, it's just like an automatic response for most of us to prevent our fears. So what we finish up doing then is we start acting in our addictions. So sometimes those addictions are physical. So, you know, I might have a lot of sadness in myself 
and, uh, and that sadness causes me to go, you know, every night I finish up having a drink of alcohol, I find that relaxes me, makes me feel a bit happy, mellow, happy, and, uh, and so I feel really comfortable with that, and then I find one drink isn't enough, so I go to two, and that makes me feel happy for a little while, and then two's not enough, you know, and after a while I'm pretty much drunk all the time, if I keep going along that path. And drunk all the time still doesn't seem to make me that happy and certainly doesn't make my environment very happy. But, but it's a way of me avoiding all of that grief. That's a physical addiction. Or what about uh, another type of addiction like uh, smoking, for example. I'm there, you know, the whole day, pressure, 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 pressure. You know what it's like. You live this a lot of your days, right? Pressure, pressure, pressure. So you get to 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, driving home. I need something to relax me. I need something to relax me. Nothing seems to relax me. And then the next day, pressure, pressure, pressure. And, and a lot of times these pressures result over periods of time. And then somebody introduces to the nicotine fix. And the nicotine fix is really good because it seems to get me out of that feeling of feeling pressured. And even emotionally it does because, you know, a lot of times people will allow you at work to have a five-minute smoke break, you know, and that relieves some of the pressure. And so it's my fear of getting suppressed and, and I need to shut it all down. And so I start taking up smoking and now the smoking takes me over. So now I smoke one pack a day and two packs a day and eventually I smoke maybe two to three packs a day and I'm there smoking away. And then after 10 years of that, I find, gee, I can't get much air much anymore when I go jogging, you know, and I can't, you know, there's a lot of body things now starting to happen as, as a result of this addiction. So there's a physical addiction. But those addictions, I feel, are a lot easier to deal with than the next group of addictions. And the next group of addictions are the emotional addictions. Right? The emotional addictions are where we're suppressing our fear and we need somebody, we're suppressing stuff under our fear, of course, and we're using fear to do that. But inside of ourselves, we're now addicted to people responding in a certain way to us. Right? So we go along to the shopping centre and we're putting through our shopping, you're the checkout operator, and this checkout operator's got to do it exactly the right bags, things in the right bags. Uh, just like we put it through at the start, right? And when the checkout operator doesn't do exactly that, we just feel anger. Right? Now there's an addiction there. We don't realise it, but the anger is proof that there is an addiction there. Right? There's some kind of addiction of control. We're worried about something. Why are we worried? Because we might have spent some money on those eggs and they just got crushed underneath the milk, you know? And so we have some addiction to what's going on. And so we finish up projecting anger, and we might not even say, we might not even get angry. We might be so suppressed we don't even really get angry at the person, but inside we're going, yeah, you know, get me another thing of that, you know, put that here this time, and, and we get a bit cross and narky with the person. There's an addiction being exposed right in that moment. And it's the emotional addictions that are actually the most difficult ones to cure. So here we have, we're now, we're now at this soul. We now have all of this causal emotion in this soul. We're carrying around with us our life. And not only are we carrying around with us, we're actually nurturing it. Do you see? We're, we're holding it to ourselves. We don't want to let it go because it feels like we're not going to cope with letting it all go. We don't believe we can cope with crying for a few weeks or a few months about a subject. So what we do is we shut all of that down, right? And we keep it all tight within. And then, of course, when you hold things in like that, you're afraid. You become afraid inside of letting those particular things go. So for many men, it might be afraid of, you know, you're afraid of losing your job. So that gets all stuck in there. You're afraid of not being able to provide for your family. So that gets stuck in there. And you, you're afraid of some things that happened in your childhood with violence. So you're, you're afraid of other violent men that get stuck in there and so forth. And there's a whole list of things that get stuck in there. And then I hold on to all of that with my fear. So it's a layer of suppression. And then whenever anybody triggers those things through their actions, I just get angry with them. And it's a great way of avoiding all of that stuff that's underneath. And then my addiction is I seek out people that don't trigger any of those things. Or conversely, I seek out people who help me avoid the things that I'm trying to avoid. 
So I've got a double-pronged addiction going out into the world now. Remember, because of the illustration we used about the child and its parent and the, la the lactating mum feeling the child's emotion, every other soul on this universe can feel what you're denying or what you're feeling, both. They can feel it all. All of this is going out. It's like, it's like you've got a smell or an odour that everyone else can smell, you know, that everyone is reacting to. And the soul is emanating this like, and, and it's attracting. The way it attracts is all of the addictions that I want other people to meet, they'll find in the community, I'll find all the people who are willing to meet that addiction in me and they'll be attracted to me. And all the addictions that I, that I want to deny I have that I want to meet in others, in other words, there's things that I'm trying to do to help others but that becomes an addiction, they will have addictions that they want from me and I hook into that and they, so they feel attracted to me and I feel attracted to them. And now we're being attracted to each other based on all of this emotional soul condition, this stuff that's inside of us that we're unwilling to release. And the problem with all of it is that most of it is disharmonious with love and so then most of it prevents us from downloading, if you like, information and love from God. So most of it prevents us from downloading the truth. No? Have any of you seen... Uh, Battlestar Galactica, the new Battlestar Galactica. Huh? It's really worth watching. Myself and Mary are addicted to them. <laughs> Not addicted to them. But. The new Battlestar Galactica are very interesting to watch because there is a lot of emotions that come up in every episode and that's why we, uh, we've, we've got the whole series, myself and Mary, and we've really enjoyed watching them. There's a lot of uh, reflection on our own life in them as well. But one of the things that happens in them, and I won't tell you everything, is that, is that the, the Cylons, they're called, are able to download information from other people and upload information. Right. Now, that's an analogy for your human soul. You're able to download information and upload information too, exactly the same way. And you can download information from God as well. But there's a method by which it happens. And that method is dependent upon how many of your emotions is, are harmonious with God's emotions. Right? So if, God's, if we say God's emotions are all harmonious with the absolute truth and absolute love, so all of God's emotions are harmonious with those two things, then as long as my emotions are harmonious with those two things, I will be able to download information and love and feelings and also truth from God. But if my emotions are out of harmony with love, in other words, they're all fear-based and I'm suppressing all this grief, shame, guilt and all these other things that are all out of harmony with love and they're, or I'm out of harmony with truth, in other words, I have belief systems inside of myself that are not the absolute truth but they're what I believe to be true but they're not God's truth. And as long as I'm holding on to all of those things, I'm really basically repelling the option of downloading truth from God. Now, when I repel the option of getting knowledge and truth from God, there is only one other way to discover truth. And that's by a painful process called experimentation. Right? So most of us, when you think back in most of your life, Hasn't most of your life been an experiment? Isn't that the case? Like, when you first had a child, those of you who have had a child, the first child, how did that one feel? That was a bit of an experiment, wasn't it? Like, a bit scary. You, you go into your first child, I remember it with my older son, and man, you know, you don't even really know even how to pick him up, let alone do anything. And, uh, and that was all the process of experimentation. Now my poor son, my, fir <laughs> my first son Tristan, his name is, um, he's now 26 years old and he uh, has been a process of my experimentation. Yeah, the poor fellow, you know. And I'm now undoing um, with him a lot of the things, uh, you know, in terms of coming to terms with love myself, undoing a lot of those damages that I've done with him that he is still having to work through. But once you connect with God, you don't need to experiment with that thing, how to look after a child. It comes automatically to you as you need it. 
Right? There's a big difference between living in your mind or living in your intellect and living in this soul space. Right? So God has this ability to download to us information about all sorts of things that we need in order to have a happy and fruitful and blissful life, but that is dependent on our soul's ability to receive that information. The lactating mother receives the information from her child no matter where her child is. Right? How is that the case? It's because she must be able to feel something from the child. Right? And it's the same with us. We can actually feel our parent and our parent can feel us. But there must be some form of communication that we become sensitive to by doing something. And what I'm suggesting is every time you hold on to fear, anger, and then the underlying emotions, you are putting a barrier down with that form of communication with God. And what I'm talking about is not some like theory, that's, uh, but it is actually a fact because you can actually experiment with it and find out that there is this method of communicating with God where all of a sudden you know what the truth is on all sorts of subjects. So many times when I'm asked questions of people, you'll notice that I can instantly give an answer about that particular subject. Well, that's because the truth is automatically downloaded to a person who's more open to receiving it and who personally brings themselves into more harmony with love and truth. And you'll notice the majority of the time, when I give you that answer, it feels, wow, yeah, that felt right too inside of you. So you obviously had the ability to receive the same answer from the same source. Does that make sense? As what I do. So you have exactly the same ability. That ability is just not developed. It needs to be developed. And the way it's developed is by bringing ourselves, our soul, into more harmony with love, our soul condition. Now that means releasing the emotions that are less harmonious with love or not harmonious with love. And that's the area that most people have most of their difficulty. Because most of us want to hold on to the emotions that we have inside of us and don't want to let go of them. And we say often to ourselves in our mind, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that. But you'd be surprised how often we do it. You see, day to day, moment by moment, God's created a universe through a thing called the law of attraction that is telling you what's wrong. Right? In, to, in your life that's disharmony with God's love and truth. Every moment, every moment it's happening. But we're not listening most of the time. Right? Because the reason why is we're only mostly listening to ourselves and these other emotions that are in us. And a lot of the emotions we're listening to are fear-based emotions. Right? So the question was asked earlier, what earth changes are going to happen to Coffs Harbour? Right? Now, if I was in this process of linking with God, can you see that I would know what's going to happen with Coffs Harbour and I'd also probably have a feeling about when it's going to happen. If the mother can have a feeling of its child desiring mum's milk, then I surely have a, can download a feeling from my parent of when everything is going to happen and what might happen. Does that make sense? Surely that can happen. Now, if that can happen, why aren't... I'm asking the question, what's going to happen to Coffs Harbour? But obviously I'm asking that question because I don't personally feel what's going to happen. Does that make sense? Why don't I personally feel what's going to happen? The reason why is some fear-based reason inside of us that we can't. Does that make sense? Not a love-based, because if it was love-based and how many were truth, we'd already know what we think, we would already feel what's happening, we'd probably already be taking action depending on what we felt was going to happen. Does that make sense? We all have this ability to use this thing. Now, people nowadays call this thing intuition. Now, I'm not talking specifically about intuition. What I'm talking about is this direct connection that you can have with God where God will tell you things that you were totally surprised about. Not that you intuitively felt were true, but uh, totally the opposite of what you believed and you have the ability to actually receive that inside of your soul as long as you release these 
emotions, these belief systems, this, all of this stuff that's disharmonious with love. So you can see straight away then that the, f the release of emotion becomes, the release of emotions that are fear-based and unloving become one of, the, one of the important things I must do if I wish to live this life that's a lot happier than what I feel I might currently have. So what do we do with our emotion? By the way, you can ask questions any time. You don't have to be silent. What do we do with our emotion? What we finish up doing is here's our, let's call this group of emotions our causal emotions. They are the emotions, the most of which we uh, had put into us during our childhood, that are all based on a lack of love. So any moment as a child that you didn't have love, you will automatically have a causal, a negative emotion created inside of you and you could at that moment feel it. So right at that moment you could feel it but the majority of us don't get to feel the whole lot of it because our parents generally shut down the process of feeling the whole lot of that emotion. Does that make sense? And the reason why our parents do that is because they have this layer of blocks. These blocks towards the causal emotion. So how many of you ladies when you had a child were distressed every time the child cried? Right? Oh, not every time. <laughs> well, pretty much like, distressed. You, feel, you felt distressed. Right? Quite a lot, right? The majority of, of us feel that. That's your own distress. That's not the child's distress. That's your own distress. And to be frank, the reason why you're distressed is you know the child's crying because of something in you. There is this underlying thing that you know this, but, but you don't want to accept that. So what you do instead is you feel distressed and panicked. I've got to fix this. I've got to fix this. How do I fix this now? You know, what do I do? You know, change the nappy. No, that didn't work. Change this. Don't feed again. No, that didn't work. You know, and we're just distressed and not understanding what the cause is, but we get distressed. Our distress is, the denial of our distress is often the cause. That's the irony. Right? And so what happens is we, we have a layer of blockages. So there, the child is crying and we're going, oh, there, there, stop now, you don't need to cry. You know, we're, we're, the, what's the emotion we're projecting? Please don't cry, please don't cry, please don't cry. Because we are distressed at the crying, so please don't cry, please don't cry is really what we're projecting at the child. Now remember the child doesn't hear the words so much as feel the feelings, feel the emotions. So the child's having inside of it, mummy's getting worse by me crying. Now, how freaked out does that feel for you when somebody who you trust and feel secure with is actually more distressed than you are? How does that feel for you as an adult? No, so, so you're about to lose your home at home and the man who's meant to make it all safe again, he's in a worse state than you are about it. How does that feel? Right? Or, you know, you're about to lose your home at home, so you go to mum and dad and talk to them about it, and they get more worried about it than you are. How does that feel? That's, you know, it feels pretty bad, actually. And so often what happens is, and this is what is going on, we have all these blockages that enter us from our environment, suppressing these causal emotions. Now, soon I'll be giving a talk about blocks specifically. Then we have our denial of the entire system. And there's a lot of ways we deny. One way is we go into self-deception type emotions. So what we do is we deceive ourselves that we're actually feeling one thing when we're not actually feeling that thing at all. But I'll give you an example of that. Sometimes I say to people, how would you like to come up here and do a talk and I sit down in the audience? Right? And you can talk for four hours without any notes for a while. And I can sit down and listen to you for a change. Most people when they hear that, particularly when they hear the without any notes <laughs> and not knowing the subject, what do most people do? It's like fear, straight away isn't it? Fear, straight away, no I can't do that, don't ask me. Like many of you even feel don't put that microphone in front of my face, right? Because of an emotion. Now what happens is that we often get into a state with regard to denying things that we start thinking the reason why we don't want to do something is because of one thing and in reality it's about another. 
Now, to give you an example, when you come up here to speak, the majority, many people will say, I don't feel worthy of doing that. Many people say that to me. And I say to them, sorry, but the motion isn't unworthiness. The motion is fear. And fear is a very different emotion than unworthiness. What are you afraid of? And when we ask the question, what are you afraid of, of speaking in front of an audience of, say, 50, 100 people, what are you afraid of? Let's list the fears. What are the fears that you feel? Saying the wrong... Why, why are you afraid of saying the wrong thing? What, because you'll be judged. Okay, so judgment, isn't it? Is that it, spell judgment or E or not E? I can't remember. Humiliation. So... Rejection. Attack. Embarrassment. How do you spell embarrassed? Double R. E S. A S. Mint just fits in. Humiliation. Misunderstood. Fool, foolish, punished. People might want to punish you. Right, that's what we're afraid of. So when we say, oh, I feel unworthy, actually, it's, you're saying you're feeling unworthy to avoid all of these feelings. Does that make sense? You're just avoiding those feelings. Right? It might be a feeling, oh, I don't know what to talk about. That might be another feeling you're just feeling. But, but see, often what we do is we say we're feeling one feeling, but in reality, that's not the feeling we're really feeling. It's a whole group of other feelings that we're trying to run away from that we're not willing to even accept within ourselves that we're actually feeling. Right? And so I would call those, all of that is the denial. The denial of all of the blocking emotions and the causal emotions. These are all blocking me from accessing, or many of these are blocking me from accessing some basic causal emotional reasons of why I can't speak in front of the group, no matter who I am. All of you are totally capable of speaking in front of a thousand people and being totally relaxed the entire time you're doing it. All of you are capable of it. Are you not? Aren't we capable of anything? So we're surely capable of that. Right? Okay. So, so we're capable of that, but there's a whole lot of blocking emotions that cause us not to do it, and that they are all fear-related. They've got nothing to do with your unworthiness. They owe everything to do with your fear. You're afraid of that for lots of reasons. So, like, when you get judged, how does that feel? Doesn't that feel terrible? Like, you, you know, you can feel the judgment coming at you. And the, judge, the judgment is not when somebody's telling you the truth about yourself, by the way. Judgment is when somebody's telling you that you're a rotten, dirty scoundrel for having that thing inside of you. Does that make sense? that you're just worthless to them. Judgment is when they are making you feel like that they are better than you. Right? Now, when somebody does that, how does that feel for you? It feel, you just feel like shrinking inside sometimes, don't you? And imagine if you had 100 people doing that. So you get up here and you start going, uh, 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 and now you're starting to feel embarrassed and all the other people are starting to feel their embarrassment. Right? Now, it would be great if everybody felt their embarrassment, but nobody wants to feel their embarrassment, so what do they do? Oh, he's an idiot. So they project at you that you're foolish, and then you're feeling even more embarrassed now, and now you can't even get any words out through the barrage of you're an idiot coming back at you, right? And you're there sitting in this emotion, and now these emotions just build up in you of all these unhealed emotions, all these fears inside of you just start, and it just overcomes you, and many people in that place go into a place of absolute terrified. Like, and so they just have to run from being in front of the people. Run from being in front of a thousand people. Or you could be in a state of love in front of that group of people. Loving them, loving yourself, having felt and healed a lot of that emotion. You could be in that place too. And you could have a barrage of emotion coming from you and be totally relaxed with it. You are capable of that. Every single person is capable of that. 
Every one of you is capable of speaking in front of 10,000 people. Then we go, whoa. Why does putting an O on the end of something make it seem more <laughs> difficult? Have you ever wondered that? Like you notice that if you say, speak in front of 10 people, like let's, let's add the O's, right? How many are capable of that? Speaking in front of one other person. All of you, all right. right. Then we add an O, you know. An O is nothing, by the way, but anyway, isn't it? It just depends where you put it. But it's nothing. But we add an O, and now how many of us are comfortable speaking in front of 10 people? How many feel comfortable? 10? Right. Half the audience will say, that's great. How many, if we add another O, how many are now comfortable? Uh, maybe, maybe a bit less. Right? And we add another O, and we're still comfortable? You feel feeling comfortable? Uh, we'll see whether you are. And we add another O, how comfortable are we still? Right? Now, that is, the comfort level is just a measure of the fear. Does that make sense? So, so if, if we're comfortable in front of one but not in ten, then we know we have a lot of people-based fears. We know we have a lot of fear about accepting judgment, accepting criticism, accepting, uh, accepting condescension from others. A lot of that emotion is present within us. Does that make sense? But if we're comfortable with a thousand but not ten thousand, then obviously that level of fear is a bit less within us. Now, now all of those people that are perfectly happy, like talking in front of 10,000, how many was comfortable with that? 10,000? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Four, four or five, six, six, any, any more? <laughs> we have an auction now. And so six of us are comfortable with speaking in front of 10,000 people. How many of you would be comfortable speaking on the subject of sex? 10,000 people. No, no, it has to be only the ones who put up their hands before who were comfortable in front of the 10,000 people. Right, okay, so some of you. How about... How about you are comfortable about talking about the specifics of the female orgasm? <laughs> Can you see straight away that different emotions come into play? Well, that's what I'm illustrating. As soon as the different emotions come into play, now our fear about these particular subjects causes us to actually shut down. It causes us to become afraid about those subjects. How many of you in front of 10,000 would be happy that the 10,000 people were a bunch of physicists and you were talking about the fission reaction? Right? Not so many would be comfortable with that. Right? And that's the reason why is because obviously we need to have also a level of knowledge that's coming to us. Right? And what I'm suggesting is when you're connecting with God all the time, you will be comfortable in front of any group on any subject of any size. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah. Of course it'd be fun. So, so all that's stopping us is the fact that we are using things to deny our blocks and we are using those blocks to deny emotions and those emotions now live within us and while those emotions live within us, they define our life. They control everything we do. Right? They control every attraction. They control every person that comes into our life. They control every person that we actually meet. They control how, what type of children, what, I mean, what, whether, when I say type of children, you can only have two types generally, male or female, but they, you, they'll control whether we give birth to a male or female child, what, who is conceived. They control everything. They control absolutely everything in our life. Either desires that are harmonious with love and pure, which we illustrate before, or emotions that are disharmonious with love are what control our entire existence. And I know from our previous discussion that we can communicate with each other on a level far greater than the level we're currently doing. Right? All of us are capable of this, but all of us have these blockages to it happening because these emotions within us cause us to put these walls up in our communication. So. Many of you might be happy speaking to a person who's quite happy and joyous and uplifting, but how many of you are happy speaking to a person who's, who's hellish in their condition? 
like really dark, like vicious, demanding, controlling. How many of us would be happy in that circumstance? Well, our own happiness in any circumstance is completely dependent upon our own emotions, not theirs. Right? So the truth is that when we heal everything within ourselves, we will be happy to do either. Right? And this is why it's so important to start focusing on these. So the whole pur purpose of emotional processing is not to just go and have a cry when you need to. The whole purpose of emotional processing is to access, it, firstly, your blocking emotions that cause you to, to shut down the entire system that God created inside of you to actually learning about the entire universe. And then the second thing is to access the causal emotions inside of you. Many of us are emotional with our addictions. Now, can I give you an illustration of that? Let's say, all of a sudden, somebody doesn't do what they've done for 20 years. So, example, I'm living in a relationship, 20 years we've been living in our relationship, and I come, I've come home from work for 20 years, and there's been dinner on the table. Huh? There's been dinner on the table. Is that good, Mike? <laughs> You, you wanted her to do that for 20 years. This week, the same day. <laughs> you offered the deal. <laughs> so the key, so there, but now I come home on that, that first day after those 20 years and there's no dinner on my table. <laughs> now, can you see that straight away those 20 years will have created an addiction? An addiction to a certain series of events occurring. And it's the emotion that created that addiction. An emotion may be that I can't cook very well, so I need someone to cook for me. Or an emotion that the woman, it's the woman's job. You know? An emotion that my mother might have created in me that it's the woman's job, even. Because she did it all of my growing life. Does that make sense? So I have this emotion in me. A woman's got to cook for me. I'm not incapable of cooking for myself. I'm barely capable of buttering the bread. You know? But aside from that, I'm, I'm not much good. And so, so, so what happens is we come home and that's not done and this expectation that is within us, which is an addiction that we've had all of our life, is being confronted right in this moment. And how do we respond? Well, usually the first response to an addiction being confronted is anger. And anger is the signpost. Every time we feel anger, that is the signpost that we're out of harmony with love we are out of harmony with love, not them. We, myself, I am out of harmony with love if I'm angry. Right in that moment. Now, I'm not saying to shut down your anger, because that wouldn't be wise either, but I'm saying you need to, do, you need to own it and feel it. You need to recognise that you're angry in that moment. And by the way, remember I say to you many times, anger is slight annoyance, frustration, right? irritation. They're all anger. All of them are angry, we're all in different levels. So, so any of those emotions are telling me straight away that I have an addiction that is out of harmony with love. Because if I was in harmony with love, I would never feel those emotions in the end. Now, the New Age movement would tell you that the way you get into those emotions is you meditate yourself into them. So in other words, you become this zen out person who's not reacting to anybody, but your law of attraction is just bringing you hundreds of events a day still that could make you angry. It's just you don't respond to them anymore. Well, that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is if you deal with the soul-based emotion, the emotion that's causal inside of yourself, what will happen is the law of attraction won't even bring you the event anymore. That, and that's proof that you've dealt with the emotion. But for most of us, what we do is we get angry. We get irritated, frustrated, annoyed, and we're feeling that. That's a signpost for our addiction, right? Now, our addiction in, that, in, in this case that I've given as an example was having someone else prepare a meal for me every night. That's my addiction in this case. And my anger is telling me that this addiction is present and it's not loving. Because the truth is, if I was in a place of love, I would come home on the 20th year. <laughs> Mind you, I probably would have done it in the first two days of our marriage <laughs> rather than the 20th year of our marriage. 
and I would be perfectly happy preparing the meal for my partner who has not prepared it. I would be perfectly happy for that. Hi, AJ. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about my previous relationship that I've discovered that's very addictive. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sort of at the stage now of working through the blocks and some of the denial that I have about it. Mm -hmm. A part of me still has disbelief that it's actually happening and it's really been going over a three-year period now. So I'm just wondering what the causal emotions um, are within myself that are, have created the addiction in the first place. Can you, do you want to be more specific or it's too personal to be no, specific? I'll, no, um, that's fine. So what do you mean? Well, what, what is the addiction you've noticed? Oh, well, we had a very passionate relationship. Yep. So, But the rest of the relationship was very problematic. Yep. So, um, and I realised that it was very much out of love. Yep. Um, so now that I've been with, with, withdrawing from the relationship, I've found that very difficult and getting into these sort of whether it's texting or some type of communication. Wanting, the, rea wanting the interaction yeah, to restart up Because again. as soon as I realise that I actually have to disconnect from it, the emotions are so intense that I try and take myself out of it. And even like a text message or something will take me out of the emotion. So, but I've dealt so with you could say of, then you're addicted yep. to the passion. Okay, yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. That's the addiction. Oh. And you follow me? <laughs> yeah. So the addiction is exactly the thing that you want back again. Yeah. Really, that's the addiction. Yeah. So you're addicted to the passion. Yeah. And um, if the rest of the relationship isn't loving, yep. you know, isn't kind, compassionate, understanding, and all those other things that are a part of love, then obviously the addiction to the passion, you're willing to overlook and even deny these other aspects. Does I that agree. make sense? Yeah. So the addiction to the passion is so great that you're willing to be unloved while, yes. as long as you have the passion. So what's the causal emotion that's driving that addiction to the passion? Okay, good question. Let me just rub some of this out. I'm addicted to the passion. Because you already know the answer actually. But let's go through the process. So you know now that you're addicted to passion. By passion, are we talking about sexual, basically sexual connection? Or are we talking more about, be more specific? Yeah, I would say it's more sexual passion, yeah. What does it include? Um, intimacy and time together. Well, let's, let's, let's call it physical intimacy yeah. or sexual intimacy. Yeah. Because it's not real intimacy. No. Real intimacy would result in the person being compassionate, kind, understanding, and yep. all these other things. Yep. That was, real intimacy would do that as well, would it yep. not? As yep. well as have the sexual passion. Yep. So let's be more specific. Okay. We need to be very specific when we're looking at our problems. Okay. So, so, so we're saying we're interested in the sexual passion, that's the addiction, and what about the <laughs> sexual passion appeals to you? Be very specific. Is it the orgasm or is it the part <laughs> leading up to or is it part after or is it, what is it? Does that make sense? Oh. You said you were free to talk about yes. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above? <laughs> yeah. So, so let's start with the beginning of the passion, which yeah. is like kissing, cuddling. Yeah, How does like that even feel? into sort of like more the tantra and the breathing and the connection with that person and all of that type of thing. Yes, yeah, so I, I would argue that. not having a connection with the person. Yeah, okay. Right, a connection with the person would result in a lot, in a lot of other things and we'll, we'll explain the connection okay. between two people in a minute in terms of this. What we're looking at specifically in this case is your addiction. Okay. And what we want to do is be very specific about that addiction. So we've got an addiction to sexual passion but what is it about it that appeals to you so much? What do you feel? What do you get out of well, it? Well, it must be the physiological feelings and... Um I guess I feel euphoric as well. So, so I get a it's sense sort of, of like orgasmic, euphoric. Yeah, just with um, euphoria. And I, I, I guess I thought that was connection or, you know, like an emotional connection. So what you're doing is you're associating sexual connection yeah. with us having like a soul connection. Yep. Does that make sense? That's yep. what you're doing? You've yep. made the association between sexual connection and soul connection. Yeah, with a committed partner, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is the partner committed? No. <laughs> Can you see you just told yourself an untruth? 
Well, when it was a commitment, I guess, when it was a committed no, relationship, but, it, but it's not now and it hasn't been like that for a long time, but we've okay. been, been going backwards and forwards. So if it hasn't been like that for a long time, was it ever really? Uh, I guess not, no. Not really, is no. it? It's like, okay. like, if I'm fully committed to Mary, yes. would, I be, would, I even would I even consider having any rela sexual relations with any th person? Yeah. I wouldn't, would I? Like, if, if, there's, a, if there's a heart... Okay, Feeling, and even so. though the relationship has um, disconnected, this has still been going on for years, this whole thing. So the relationship's disconnected, but yep. you're still wanting to get sexually involved with the person. Yep. We're still very, we still, if we're in the same room, that passion's there and it's very strong. Yep, yep. 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 Um, can I just stop calling it passion? Okay. So Let's call it what it is. Yeah. Sexual addiction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Can you, can you see straight away, and this is really good for everyone to understand, we don't want, we feel ashamed a lot of looking at ourselves truthfully. There's no shame in this process. It's just a process of looking at myself truthfully. Okay, um, passion would involve all aspects of my life and it would encompass being kind, considerate and all these other things and it won't just be in one area of my life, my sexual life, but it will be in every possible... Like, so if I'm passionate for Mary, I'm not just passionate for her body, I'm passionate for her mind, her soul, her feelings, her... her I want to know her, I want to feel her, I want to feel everything about her. That's what real passion is. Does yeah. that make sense? I guess I equate sexual addiction to, you know, what I've seen with addictive behaviour. Um, Isn't yours addictive? Yeah, it's just, it seems to be can, a little bit different rewind? than going and picking up people on the street and constantly being... Oh, yeah, no, yeah. but there's other emotions that prevent you from doing that. Right, OK. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is awful. But if you didn't have those other emotions, you might do that. Oh, gosh. Does that make sense? Like, <laughs> it's OK. OK. But can you see how there's this almost instant dismissal of what's really going on there's this desire to not really know sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this is why many of us struggle with dealing with our causal emotion because we don't, we feel so ashamed yeah. of identifying, oh, no, no, yeah. not that, not that, not that, you know, anything else but that, you know. And, and often then we convince ourselves. So, for example, I might have 20 monogamous relationships in a row and, and I say, well, at least I'm not immoral. <laughs> right? Where, and what we're really saying is my definition of immoral is having relationships at the same time. That's really what we're saying. But having 20 different relationships can have a lot of immorality in it. Like when I say immoral, out of harmony with love, relationships become immoral, out of harmony with morals. Morals are when I have integrity and honesty and openness and all of those things. How can you maintain monogamous relationships one after the other how many of those relationships were actually moral in the sense that you had integrity, honesty, openness, truthfulness with that person on every subject? Not many relationships fall into that category, do they? Right? But it just depends on what our definition of moral is. If our definition of moral is, I just don't have sex with someone else while I'm having sex with you, then my definition of moral is very different than, than, what, than, than that definition. So let's get back, though, to the addiction. Let's call it what it is. I feel drawn, like uncontrollably drawn. Uncontrollably drawn means addiction. <laughs> right? So I have an addiction. I feel uncontrollably drawn to sexual passion with one person in particular. Yep. Does that make sense? So this is not with everybody, but with one person in particular. So I'm telling myself, oh, the good thing is it's not with everybody. At least I've got over that addiction, whatever that one might be. And now I'm just focused on one person. Like I'm just totally drawn to this one person. No matter whether they're in a relationship with someone else or not, that's almost, that's immaterial to me. Right? I'm just drawn to them, drawn to them, drawn to them. Isn't that how, what's happening here? That's right, yep. Okay. So what am I drawn to really? I'm drawn to, so I've got to be honest with myself, there's something in this, per this, this person. So this person, let's describe this person. Now, whoever is this person, if you're ever watching this video, <laughs> you'll remember that we have not named you. So, but go ahead. H how would you describe the person you're irresistibly drawn towards? He's very physically attractive. Physical attractive? 
Uh, he's young, younger than myself, 12 years younger. He's 12 years younger? Yeah. He has a calming sense about him, like a calming type personality. He can be soothing. Soothing? Yeah. Um, yeah, he's, ca he's a calm person. He's so... Um, he sort of can he can connect to meditation and he's calming and that sort of thing. Uh, I would say he's fairly kind, um, but <laughs> but that varies no, sometimes. Let's go with this. Because because he can be very self-absorbed a lot of the time, so. So sometimes he's self-absorbed. Yeah, so he's self-centered. What, what what we notice first whenever we list anything about a person that we're addicted to. Generally, we only list the things that we like to see. That's what I'm illustrating by this list. So you like to see that. You like to see that he's younger than you. There's something in that. You like to see that he's soothing and calm and so yeah, forth. Yeah, and he has a set of moral beliefs that, that I like. So he has a set of I'm sorry, morals. but I ha would have oh, to disagree with okay. you completely on okay. that one. He yeah. actually does not have a set of moral beliefs you like. You've convinced yourself that he does. Okay, yep. And there's a very big difference between convincing yourself of something and it actually being the case. Case in point, when he sees you and you feel drawn to him, even if he's in a relationship, he feels drawn to you, does he not? Yes, but he's never been in another relationship, but yep. I'm not saying that oh, whether okay. the fact that he's drawn to yes. you yep. means he's not being honest in that relationship right at that moment. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, but he's not ever been in another relationship though. So he's been in casual liaison? Yes, that's right. Is casual liaisons loving? No. So how can that be kind? Yeah, that's not. Uh, even to himself? Yep. Uh, can you see, what we finish up doing is we finish up going down the chart of justifying why we have a certain addiction. And this is what you're really doing here. These things are a very pa important part of the underlying causal emotion, right? right yeah. but, but you're justifying the addiction yeah. and not looking at the entire picture. This is what we often do when we're dealing with any emotion. Yeah. So, so, we say, so I say to people about their parents, for example, I say, your parents were not loving to you. They, people put out their hands, my parents were loving to me, they did this, that and this. Yeah, did they smack you as well? Oh yeah, yeah, they did that too. And did they, you know, and I list a lot, a lot, a lot of other things they did. Yeah, they did that too. Are all those things loving? Oh, well, yeah, I think they're loving. You know, and this is, very, this is the problem. We think things are loving that God knows is totally out of harmony with love. That's the issue we face, right? So there's something going on here where yeah. you think something's loving that is not loving. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we need to be prepared to firstly acknowledge that there's got to be something here. Yeah. All right. So this is the man. <laughs> All right. I put kind in brackets because I want to address the issue. Um, but we think it's soothing, calm and so forth. Okay. How old is he, by the way? Can you tell me? 26. 26, yeah. So he's a 26-year-old hunk, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> What do you feel yeah. having a 26-year-old physically attractive man being attracted to you? Like if this was now a 46-year-old unattractive man yeah. being attracted to you, what would you feel? Mm, no, that wouldn't work. <laughs> Because you see it, can you see it makes you feel different things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I get you. Okay. Yeah. And Mary's got a 47-year-old unattractive man being attracted to her, <laughs> and she's fine with it, right? So. Oh. So, so what's going on is. What was that? That's sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's going on is that there's got to be something that it makes you feel. You see, every addiction is based around what it makes you feel about you, generally. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So uh, having a relationship with this man makes you feel, more than any other person you've ever met, makes you feel something 
that you don't normally feel. Mm -hmm. And yep. you've become addicted to that feeling. Yep, I agree, yep. So what is the feeling you're addicted to? Now, I asked you at the beginning whether, whether it was an orgasm or whatever, and my suggestion is that it isn't. Actually. Okay. Because you it's could orgasm with... Yes. Well, basically, you can orgasm with any man on the planet if, if he is interested in making yeah. you orgasm, but that doesn't make a relationship, yeah. and neither does it make a, a soul connection. Mm -hmm. The truth is, under your definition of a soul condition, you have a soul connection with 3.4 billion men because every one of them is possibly going to be able to make you orgasm. Does that make sense? Okay. So that doesn't constitute a soul yeah. connection. Yeah. There's something about this man yeah. in particular that, yeah. that makes you feel something inside of yourself yeah. that you don't want to give up. And, and there's a reason why you don't want to give it up. There must be some reason. Yeah. And you just got, you feel drawn back to it, drawn back to it, yeah. drawn back to it. It's one of the reasons why you're not entering into a relationship yeah. with anyone else, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because you feel con constantly drawn to this. Yeah. Yep. But he's not entering a relationship with you. No. So, you know, there's obviously something going on. So what is it? What does it no, make no, you no. feel? I just know, I, I guess I'm more connected when, I, when it's not there and I don't have it, you know, um, how that makes me feel and I've been really... So let's make, yep. let's list the things that you feel when you don't have it. Yeah, do okay, feel? so I'm rejected. It's rejection you and feel abandonment. Rejected. Yeah. Yep. And abandoned. Abandoned. Um, fearful. You feel afraid? Why yeah. do you feel afraid? What, list the specific fears. Whenever, the problem with saying I'm afraid is that it's very, very general and it doesn't help you process emotion, right? I'm you fearful to, of letting so him go, like it's a fear of letting go or something. Why are you afraid of letting him go? What, what's... Um, I think it comes back to the rejection and abandonment stuff. Right, so you've already listed those two. Yeah, yep. that's the main, they're the main two. Um, and I know How do you feel about yourself as a woman when he's not touching you and holding you? And um, well, I guess I've gone through years of um, progression and um, years of um, improving my self-esteem and my self-worth, but that has been um, an ongoing thing there. Yeah, so, so let's just rewind all of that yep. and make out you didn't say it. Okay. <laughs> I asked well, I feel, just confident about, I feel confident about myself. Sorry, about me as a woman. Was that the question? Do you? Yep. How yep. can you feel confident and yet rejected? You see, see, see well, it I'm... Feels I'm like this thing. You know, but I'll put to you, I if you were confident about yourself as a woman and you loved yourself as a woman, yeah. nobody would make you feel the feeling of rejection. Yeah, I think it's when it comes to this, AJ, in this particular area, I guess I'm confident in a lot of other areas. And okay, so it's in I agree with that. So it's in this particular area. What's the particular area you're not um, confident in? The relationship in? area. Right, so, so the there's male, a... The connection. So there's a real lack of confidence about relationships? Yeah, I think you, it's you, coming back to my father's stuff. And the truth is, actually, it all comes back yep. to your father's stuff. Yep. So rather than just saying see specifically where it comes. But, so you feel rejected, abandoned. Yeah. Yep. And why is there this sexual thing in it, do you think? Like, why is it to do with sexual... It's got to be a sexual yeah. rejection, doesn't it? Yeah. A sexual abandonment. Does that make sense? It's like yeah. totally different than you just having a relationship where you feel secure and then he runs off on, with somebody else. Yeah. That's more of a general abandonment. Yeah. This is more of a sexual abandonment, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so well, I didn't know any of these wounds existed until he actually walked out and then everything appeared. And to be honest, when I first started to feel the emotions around it that felt like I was going to die, so the emotions have been very severe and I've come down over the years in severity, yep. but I'm still left with, you know, trying to really get to what the cause is yep. and working on what that is to try and... Um, relieve myself from yep. that law of attraction. When you cry about being rejected, yeah. what do you do? Um, well, I can normally go back into um, uh, really, really deep sorrow and it's almost like my soul is um, aching and um, you know, I'm crying and aching in that space of rejection. Yep. And feeling unworthy and but unlovable. Can you feel like the there's projection no coming out of you towards him. And the projection is, I wish you were with me. Yes. Yep. Can you feel that? Yep. Like, I wish you were with me. Yeah, I don't want to believe that, that it's happening. 
you don't actually want to believe it's going to ever be over. No, that's right. No. And th this is years now. Yeah, 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 yeah I understand. Yeah. So, so re when you're actually crying and you're projecting that a requirement to somebody else, mm, you're not, not actually dealing with a causal emotion. No, okay. Yeah. Does everyone understand that? See, when, if I have a projection, let's say, let's say I'm getting rejected by somebody and I'm crying because of the rejection, but I'm projecting at them that they shouldn't have rejected me, I am actually not in the causal emotion. I am in the self-deception emotion. And I can cry like that for 20 years and nothing will get released. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? So, so it's pointless doing that for us to grow. Right? But it's tempting because it, it feels a temporary relief yeah. of our condition. But the problem is the next day we're going to have to do the same crying again. And the next day we're going to have to do the same crying again and so forth. And we'll be crying for years and years and years but still not getting anywhere and actually still not getting closer to God or closer to ourselves either. I know you've been working on your self-esteem issues but there's one area of your self-esteem issues that you have not been working on because you've been in addiction. And that's your sexual esteem, okay. yep. your sexual self-esteem. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. So what happens when the man that you want, and there's even a reason why you want this particular man, the man why, that you want doesn't want you. Yep. I agree. And how does that feel inside of you? Well, it's a feel I can't stand that feeling. <laughs> I can't stand it. Yeah. And that's the feeling you're going to have to feel. Okay. I, I felt some emotions around feeling the truth. The truth is that he did not love me. And I've, I felt some emotions around that. But yeah. then the next few days it seemed to shift into something differently. And those feelings of the truth that the man didn't, that he doesn't love me sort of then went back to um, my emotions around my father figures not loving me. So I've sort of gone back through that channel. Um, yep. But then, you know, a few days there seems to be another type of layer or another type of emotion I'm dealing with. Yep. So... Um, so I'm still sort of stuck with which, which causal I should be concentrating on. Um, my feeling is go into the emotion of the re sexual rejection and really allow yourself to start feeling it deeply. But the sexual rejection is, there's an addiction in it for yourself. That's, so th what I'm saying is that you have this addiction, which is a yeah. projection of, of, to this other person that they must satisfy. They are the only person that yep. can satisfy yep. this passion, this desire that you have, the desire to be sexually aroused yeah. when you're with the person, he can only satisfy. Yeah. And what it's happening, what's happening, if you look at it from a metaphysical perspective, is here's his body, here's yours, your spirit body, right? There are certain connections that are going out of you and out of him that are totally compatible with each other that cause the sexual inflammation, if you like, uh, to, to intensify. Um, but the heart connection is not operational. Mm. If it was, he couldn't even, he couldn't even um, decide. He could, the truth is, he couldn't even become aroused yeah. if you were being hurt, if the heart connection was yeah. operational. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the truth is that while you have a connection going on at the first and second chakra levels to do with worthiness and sexual unworthiness, right, He's making you, he's satisfying your sexual unworthiness feelings to the greatest degree that any other man has and therefore you're addicted to him. Right. Uh, the question was, what's his addiction? His addiction is to actually make an older woman feel sexually attractive. Right? So his stuff's to do with his mother. Yeah. Right? So his, his, his stuff is about making another person, and by the way, even if it was a younger woman, it would still be to do with his mother. Um, it's about making a woman feel like she's sexually attractive and sexually fulfilled and all of those things, and it validates him as a male. Yeah. So his addiction is, I'm not a male unless the woman is having these reactions to me. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's his addiction. So he will find a woman exactly like yourself. Okay. And... The two of you, based on the both of the addictions, will get together, but it will not be a satisfying relationship because there's all these other parts of you which are like your 
solar plexus chakra and your heart chakra and your throat chakra and all of those different other places which are all governed by different emotions this one by fear this one by love this one by truth none of those are operational right and uh, and you're not even willing to be truthful about him right let alone truthful with yourself about what's driving the relationship and so so none of those other chakras are operational so the entire thing is concentrated in the first and second chakras and, and therefore concentrated on those emotions. So those emotions are all to do with you know, desiring, wanting somebody to desire you. And in this case, because it's a, a younger man who's physically attractive, it's a part of how unattractive you feel at times about yourself. Yeah. Yeah? And you know that you've felt that a lot in the past and yeah. you've told yourself a lot that you're over that. Yeah. But actually, as soon as you get together with him, all of those come back up. things yep. come up as yep. well, which is telling you you're not over that, right? Does that make sense? So whatever work's been done in the past about it wasn't real. Okay. It was just because this relationship is exposing that it's not real. So, so this man is the perfect man to trigger these emotions in you. Yeah. That's the basis of the relationship. Now the key is to feel those emotions but you're not feeling them. Okay. What you're feeling yep. is a projection at him that he should come back. Yeah, I, I think I've gone through whole layers, AJ. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that might be one of the layers and the other layers have been um, back to Can the, I ask the you father? a very blunt question though? Yep. Right now, do you want him back? If he walked in the door today and said, There I would want be you, something there automatic. Yeah, there'd be something there automatic. Oh, uh, he's been contacting me in the last few weeks and I've really been, I haven't been contacting him at all mm -hmm. and really been trying to ask God to help me with the emotions. The fact that, that are he's been it. contacting you yeah. means at the soul level, just like the mother with yep. the child, yep. there's automatically a contact going on. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So don't, stop telling yourself that you haven't contacted him back. Okay. Because the truth is this emotion existing in you is the contact back. Yes, yep. Does that make yep. sense? Yep. This is the contact back. He feels this from you. Yeah. He feels this big sexual neediness for him, right? And he goes, yeah, you know, I can feel she wants me. I can feel she wants me. Okay. I can feel she wants me. Yeah. You don't have to say a word, send a text message, pick up the phone or go and visit him and he'll know you want him. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so is this is coming contact. back to um, sexual injuries, AJ? I've been recently dealing with some emotions around my birth mother um, and um, I was adopted out but she was raped and I've been dealing with some emotions of um, going into terror and feeling like men are coming at me and hurting me and um, there's You're been lots of sexual shame around that that I've been dealing you with. You were a result of a rape, yes. weren't you? Yes. Yeah. And can you see that has a huge bearing on this? Yeah. yeah. And that's the causal emotions. And when you allow yourself to actually get to those emotions, yep, just allow yourself to feel it, it's okay. When you allow yourself to get to those emotions completely, you will find all of this will just go away. It will all go away. When you're the result of a rape and then get, and then get um, given away, basically, what, what happens is that there's a huge amount of emotion in that, both about the father and the mother. On the father side, there was a lot of rage, sexual rage, that he was acting out towards your mother. Right? And that sexual rage was a part of your, con your being conceived. Yeah, I've gone back into the womb and I felt the emotions around then. It feels like I'm growing in hell. Yep, yep. And then your mother had a whole series of emotions about the rape and therefore rejection of you. Yeah. So you've got a lot of rejection from the male going on and some rejection and of the, the female as well. Yeah. The rejection of the female is going to be how you see yourself. Okay. The rejection of the male is how you will see the male. So that event is causing this entire attraction. Okay, so that's the one I've been going back to um, more recently when Good. I've been doing lots of emotional processing. Yep. I just feel like the man's coming at me and is trying to sexually hurt me. Yep. And what you need to do is a lot more work in this, that, in in that this area. area. Okay. And in fact, you don't need to worry about these other areas so much. Okay. You need to focus on that particular event yep. and the feelings you have surrounding that event. And you'll find that once you release a lot of it, you, you, there's two sides to it inside of yourself. One side 
is that you, how you see yourself. So you know all the work you've done, lots of lots of sort of um, what I'd call uh, love type. programming type work yeah, you've done okay. towards yourself to try to get yourself to have some self-esteem. Yeah. Um, when you actually release this event, self-esteem will automatically come to you. Okay. Do, yeah. do you follow me? Yeah. And then on the other side, with regard to the male, that is a lot about what your mother's emotions were while you were in the womb yeah. um, for that nine-month period, carrying, carrying all these emotions about the rape yes. that she was unwilling to deal with. Yeah. And actually, I feel... Do you know your mother now? I've only met her once. Right, yeah. yeah. She's still unwilling to deal with them, yep. actually. Yeah, um, And so, you know, she's been carrying those emotions all of her life. Yes. Um, so she has a lot of emotions about, uh, about this entire thing as well. Yeah. But, but, the, but the important thing for you with the male is to realise that what you're looking for is a male who sexually accepts you and who has no sexual rage. In fact, what you're looking for is okay. a male who's totally the flip side opposite of that. Yep. Well, In other words, he would have been, he's a which bit is like what that. he is. Yep. Where he, so what he is, is he's, he, he is willing to try to satisfy the emotion in him I'm talking about yeah. is that he is willing to satisfy any woman sexually that he can right. in order to feel good about himself as a male. Right. Right. And he would never harm those women violently. Yep. He, and this is why you are attracted to the soothing calmness. Calming, yep. he, he would never harm them violently, but actually he is harming quite a lot of women in the process because the women have the flip side emotional injury okay. that he is ad having the addiction with. But what's happening is you're going to attract a man who in every way possible, sexually, will, will be projecting at you the opposite emotions to what your mother felt from, your, from her rape, yep. from the rapist. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what you're attracting. That's your addiction. Yeah. And every one of these attractions, by the way, with sexual attractions, almost all of them, they all come from some fairly severe childhood trauma usually, right, in some case. And it might not necessarily be your trauma. Yeah. It could also be your mother's, mother's yeah. trauma. Yeah. So, so that's the thing to bear in mind. So, so... In your case, this is the entire, the entire thing is based upon that. Now, now when you're looking for this, mm -hmm. you're looking for this soothing, calm, attractive, kind, considerate yeah. uh, man who just wants to please the woman at every possible opportunity. That's the kind of guy yeah. he is outwardly, right? Wants to please, and he definitely wants to please the women sexually. Like there's a real strong desire in him to do that. And... And that's the kind of man you're going to be attracted to while you're denying the other man. And the other man is the rageful, sexually violent man that was the father. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's the person you need to allow yourself to feel about. Okay, so those emotions I've been feeling more recently and when I feel the man come at, at me um, and I can feel a violent man and I equate that to like, it feels like, the, a bikey gang type mentality and yeah. that's the emotions I'm feeling coming from the man. So let this, yourself go into uh, yeah. these emotions. They're yeah. quite hard to go into, I know. Yeah. But these are the healing emotions. And once, okay. you, once you release, there's a whole layer of terror. Yes. Um, that firstly needs Which is to, her terror. That's her is, mum's terror. Yeah. Mum's terror of the event yeah. entered you. Yes. And so there's a whole layer of terror. So that needs to firstly be released. Yeah. And then underneath that terror is the sexual rejection. Like there's this deep sexual rejection. From a rape, the woman feels deeply sexually like dirty and rejected. Yep. And, and, and those emotions entered you as well. Yeah, and they're some of the emotions I have been feeling more recently. And this man makes you not feel sexually dirty anymore. That's right, yep. He, you know, he desires you sexually so much that he overcomes the feeling in you of sexual dirtiness. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So there's a, wow. lot, there's, yeah, a lot, yeah. there's a lot in that. Isn't it? Yeah. So can you see the patterns yeah. of what's going on? And there's quite a few layers to it, AJ. Like it's not just necessarily one causal emotion. I feel like if I can get through to this, through this one, mm -hmm. I'll be fairly. I feel like I'm going to be fairly free in this area. But there's a lot to it. Yes. There's a lot of layers and a yeah. lot of emotions. I, and a lot I agree. Of terror yeah. and yeah. The, the terror layers are going to be the most difficult for you, and in fact, they're the reason why you're looking for the addiction. Okay. Because you you don't want to feel the terror layers. All right. Once you feel the terror layers, you'll be far less into in the addiction. Yeah. Most addictions, remember, are driven by the denial of the fear. Okay. And terror is the biggest fear that you can possibly 
feel. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So, so when, we're, when we're denying terror, we're going to have very big addictions. Okay. So every really powerful addiction is driven by a denial of terror in some, at some level. Yeah. yeah. And denial of the underlying event, generally. There's usually an event associated with these things. Okay. Yeah. Thank that, you, AJ. Yeah, that's that good. Thank so you. So can you see the pattern is you want to... I feel the man was uh, older than, the, uh, than your mother as well. Uh, right. Pro probably even maybe double your mother's age, actually. Yeah. Um, your well, mother she can't was even remember young. what she... Yeah, she was young and she had to hide the pregnancy and go away to the yeah, Salvation Army shame. and lots, lots of, shame. of shame. So I felt very embarrassed and very shamed when I was four and five when I knew I was adopted. Yep. Yeah. And that was, I, I now understand that was her shame. Yes. Um, and she said that he was Italian or, you know, dark looking, so she didn't even really know what he looked like. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. so, yeah, and a lot of the emotions you're carrying are related to that event. Okay. And now, now while that might sound scary, it also means that you can focus your attention emotionally on this event yep. and actually deal with the majority of your underlying causal emotions. Yeah, through that. Through okay. that event. That's so great. That, that's a really good thing yep. uh, that that can happen like that. A lot of other people have very indeterminate emotions and therefore are a lot more difficult to focus on specific things. The beauty of an addiction is that it exposes the emotions very harshly to us but in a way that's quite good because it, it's the emotions that are exposed harshly to us that we finish up dealing with d first generally, that we want to deal with first. And because of that, we can get through some very big events very rapidly. The most difficult emotions sometimes are the emotions that are very, very fine little emotions about where we're not loving. And they often take many years to deal with because they're not, it's not being slammed in our face at every moment. So, so, but the terror is going to be the biggest Okay. Issue that you're yep. facing. Yeah. Thank you, AJ. No worries. Thank cool. you. You're just going. Um, when I process, I don't have many tears, and I'm wondering if I'm going causally, and 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 how I'm going on the on the track. I guess. If you're saying by process, you're saying you're crying. Yes. Um, and if you're crying and you don't have tears, then you have a block. Uh, the truth is that a child, when it cries, always has tears except for one circumstance. Have you noticed the circumstance? In your children, when they cry without tears? That's when they are, when you call it crocodile tears, what is it? They are trying to get attention. They are, they are trying to manipulate their environment in some way. Does that make sense? And so what happens when we are crying without tears is there's still a block that there's something wrong with the tears. And while there's a block about there being something wrong with the tears, the actual tears won't fully come. The actual causal emotion won't fully be released. So what you need to look at for is, a, is the emotions regarding things like... This is Paul, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. What, um, what you need to look at are the emotions regarding your belief systems around crying. Does that make sense? And uh, those belief systems range, there's a large range of them, right from if you cry, you're no longer a man, you know, be a man, stop crying, from that stuff, right the way through to every time you cried, I, I gave you something cry, to cry about. Do you know what I mean? And so therefore, you had to hide your tears, you had to try to control them and control the whole process of crying. So in between that, there's a large gamut of, of all sorts of projection or blocking emotions that your parents would have projected at you for you to not have tears when you cry. The truth is when you're fully feeling a causal emotion regarding grief, you will always have tears. It's, it's, sometimes, I, get, I mean, mostly I get a tiny bit, but hardly any. You sort of water up. It, just a little bit, but then I can watch a movie, something on a movie, and it'll make me cry more. Exactly. So, so, so what are you looking for? See, quite often when we're crying and there's, and there's no water, and the, you know, we're not really te teary, yes. and then we watch a movie and we are really te teary, what are we looking for? We've, we're basically saying, I can't feel this emotion unless somebody else external to me, yes. right, in this case the, pl the players in the movie, but unless somebody else external to me actually validates that I'm allowed to have this emotion. So part of the problem might be that you don't feel your emotion is valid unless somebody else is sharing it with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you need to investigate these things 
for yourself. They're, they're all blockages to the underlying emotion. Mm. Yeah? Okay. AJ, just getting back to this young lady, if she deals with that emotion, um, does that have what, what relationship is that then to her mother and her dealing with that emotion? Does that help her? No. no. No, just the other way around. If she dealt with it's it, it's the other way around. Yeah. yeah. If the mother had dealt with this emotion at any time, um, you would have. What was your name? Sorry, Mel. Mel would have found it much more difficult, uh, much more easily to access her emotions if Mum had dealt with this emotion at any point in time, up until this point. But, but the truth is that mum is in far more of a shutdown state than Mel herself is. So if Mel waits for mum to deal with her emotion, she might be waiting for a long... She might even be waiting until she passes into the spirit world before her mum will deal with this emotion. The truth is, too, her mum actually has a very strong spirit influence to avoid the emotion. Uh, most raped women uh, have a group of raped women in the spirit world attached to them in the end. And so uh, dealing with the rape not only means dealing with your own emotional resistance to the feelings, but dealing with the spirits around you, emotional resistance to their own feelings about their own rape. And it's, it's like being surrounded by 100 people who are all saying, don't you go there, don't you go there. And it's very, very difficult under those circumstances to go there. Um, so it requires a lot of courage and bravery and not, not many people on earth have that courage and bravery to deal with those emotions. Of course they could have. But uh, if they had a different belief system about the emotions themselves. So, you know, uh, the truth is that mum feels quite ashamed of herself and she feels like she attracted it, she encouraged it and all these other emotions that are in her that's causing her to not want to actually feel the, the, the emotions that created the event, if you like. And, and so Mel waiting for that action to happen, she'd be waiting, I feel many, many years. Now it is true that Mel dealing with the emotion can have an effect on mum dealing with it later if mum is open to dealing with the emotion herself. But the thing is this emotion is in Mel because of mum's lack of desire to deal with it within herself. Um, so it's highly unlikely that her mum will deal with it uh, before Mel deals with it. Yeah. Of course it would be such a blessing to Mel if mum did do that. Um, I just want to say thank you to AJ, to you and all your DVDs, because I could deal as a mum with so many denied emotions I had zero idea of, because I was always a perfect mum and everything with the other three children was working perfectly well. And from 16 years on, I was always on some doing something spiritual courses and all over the world and spending heaps of money. Yeah. And 18 years ago, I gave birth to a dis disabled child. She has Down syndrome. And li later on, I found out she has a hearing disability and she has autism. And I never once cried about it. And I actually still haven't cried about it because yeah. I had all those new age strategies. Yes. Yep. And every quarter of a year, I went to some kind of retreat yeah. to keep me afloat. And yeah. it worked per perfectly well yeah. uh, in all other areas. But my disabled child, she went downhill, refusing to get dressed, refusing to get in the car, refusing to cut fingernails, refusing to wash hair, to, to comb hair. So, refusing and I can get on and on soiling her bed after yeah. she was, when she was uh, a young child, never soiled her bed. Yeah. So anyway, I can go on and on and on. It was refusing to eat the good, good food. And refu yeah, and now with food, she was okay because I had that under control. Yeah. <laughs> But so, and I always, all, I did, all, I had some money and, and uh, did lots of courses to learn all those strategies with disabled kids. Yep. Also, I was a teacher, so I knew a lot anyway and was yep. very proud of myself. And because she is in severely intellectually disabled, so all my strategies didn't work in the end and only for a couple of weeks. Yep. So, and what I, what I only found out recently, I mean, I listened to the DVDs and all, I knew it in my head. But only a couple of weeks ago, I actually can now immediately, if she sits on the floor and not wanting to move, I know it's me. And I look immediately, what was my fear? What was my thought? 
And it could have been, for example, recently my other daughter, she has a baby and her husband has children. And we, we were together at an event and everything seemed happy. And suddenly she attacked my little grandchild and I immediately, usually I would just cope in a different way. Yes. But yeah. immediately I knew it, I have to look and I haven't found it right away. But at least I found the block. I found that moment to look. And then she calmed down. So I've, and did you I, I just want to say it's such, a, it's such, such an enlightening experience, experience yeah. to know I can finally do something yeah. when I have looked everywhere. Uh, basically, yeah, I've looked, I have looked everywhere to help her and me to cope with our lives because it's quite lonely as a single mom with a disabled child. But I have only always helped myself to be in that happy bubble. And I was always happy. Mm -hmm. Had workshops at my place and whatnot, going to other events. Yeah. And I was always happy. Yeah. And I knew all the latest things which happening in, was happening in the world, with which guru and <laughs> whatnot. <laughs> and my child was the proof that it didn't, nothing worked. But I didn't know it until I found you. And even then it took me half a year to even... Um, to understand what I was really saying yeah, in a practical yeah. way. And I couldn't cry. I went to also processing group and I thought, oh, for God's sake, that's the last thing <laughs> I want to do. Because I never cried. You don't cry. Yeah, if yeah. you're intelligent and whatnot, you don't cry. Yeah. And a, a disabled child is actually one of the best reflectors of a person's emotion. And the reason why is because they can't, they don't have the intellectual barriers we have established to, to in, a, in what we call a normal child. A normal child has received all these intellectual and emotional barriers to feeling, their, feeling theirs and your emotion. Whereas a disabled child, so-called disabled, they're not very disabled when it comes to emotions, they are spot on the ball every single time when it she comes to She is spot on, I never knew where to look. Yep. And I just want to say that to every other mother too, you don't need to have a disabled child yep. to finally wake up. Exactly. You can do it with your own child every moment. And I'm just regretting because my other three children, they are so intelligent and I took them, they went to Sai Baba and took them to other events or one of them went to Sai Baba. So anyway, and they, like me, are not have, have never learned to deal with their emotions. And, and, and another thing is, I never watched in my whole life movies. Yep. Because first of all, I grew up with television when 1956 in Germany, we had television. Yep. And so I didn't want that in my life anymore. And also, I only, in, as an adult in Australia, I only watched a movie when I was feeling really bad, which happened very rarely. Yeah. yeah. Then I watched a nice movie. And now you're recommending various movies, and that was also the last thing I wanted to do. Yeah. Because I walked out of so many cinemas with a partner also, because I wanna, don't want to see that crap. It's just an illusion. It's not true anyway. Yeah. And blah, blah, blah. And now I'm watching movies, and I can cry. And I think of every single movie, I think of something in my past, and I can look at it. And, and see where a uh, relationship between them. Yeah. What, what you've been doing a lot, Rita, is that is now you're actually being honest with yourself. Exactly. For, for the first yeah. time in your spiritual development. In exactly. A way. Yeah. And I was looking down. I mean, I knew there was something like spiritual materialism, but I wasn't one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and most people who, who are in the New Age movement have this almost haughty look at everything else, but in reality, what you're just relating is this soul condition reflection of your child back to you as a parent. That is the perfect reflection of your own condition. Yeah. It's just so wonderful. Like, it's a beautiful thing. It's not a bad thing. No. It's a beautiful yeah. thing to actually acknowledge and then work with. Yeah. And I just want to say, I'm so, so, so grateful. I can't, I can't believe it. It's just <laughs> changed my life. That's great. Yeah, yeah. thank you. There's a lot, we, we've known a lot of, uh, we know quite a number of people who've got autistic children or, or uh, Down syndrome children. And when they actually apply the uh, principles of divine truth in their own soul, the child just changes immediately. That's immediately. The, the At the drop of a pin. Yeah, yeah. 
And so everything you say is true because with normal children, they have the intellect. That's right. Yeah? They have to work again. But my child hasn't. That's right. But I never knew to look there, so yeah. I just can't believe it. Yeah, and so she is, in a way, your perfect yeah. road home to God. And right? my life is now so easy. Yep. Yeah, I can't believe it. And the other beautiful <laughs> thing, Rita, is, you know what the other beautiful thing is? Yeah. She will lead you home to God enough for you to become at one with God, and you know what you'll be able to do then? What? You'll be able to heal her of her Down syndrome. Well, I have, heard, I've, I've heard that when she was born in the New Age movement. Yeah. yeah. So that you think that is possible. Yeah. Because actually she's quite intelligent. I thought other Karen says it too. Yeah. Yeah. She's very intelligent, even though she has a low IQ. But who cares about IQ, yeah? yeah. So, so <laughs> the, I, I, that's the beauty. Is, is a child who is so in tune with their own emotions, like an uh, like a autistic or Down syndrome child is, can actually lead you to God so rapidly, if you're humble, can lead you to God so rapidly that by the time you get to God, you'll be able to heal the child. Yeah, and I want to say something else. I have another daughter. She went to Harvard, so she's highly, highly intelligent, yeah? And that is so funny. If she visits, she is so much drawn to her. She's so much, so patient with her, yeah? But she's just the opposite, so she would never come here because it's just an, another fad his, never her know, mother really. has. <laughs> With the amount of changes you're making, you never know what yeah. might happen in the future. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop now for a break uh, because it's uh, 3.30 by the looks, something like that. So, um, but we'll, if we can, um, I think there's teas up the back, darling, what's, what's the teas up the back? Some of you brought some snacks, I think. Maybe not. But there is tea up the back and everything. And we'll start again in about half to three quarters of an hour time. Is that all right?